Right. So welcome everyone. This is our Flips Learning Reflected session. For those that have been here before, you'll be familiar with this, but we've, we've run these topics twice before. And uh, the first one was the original running and then under the, the guise of reactivated and now they're reflected session. So um, when you view the page, you'll find the resources and the recordings from the previous sessions lower down the page. And then what we're using for these newer sessions is just this panel here that um, gives you a, a welcome to the Flip Learning Reflected session. There's a page about us and then details of our guest speakers and links to their um, presentations if we've got them in advance or afterwards if we've got them after the session. Um, but before we go on to our guest speakers, um, Lillian, you want to just do um, an overview of the flip learning activity that we uh, we sent out. So I'll stop my screen sharing. So yeah. Okay. So moment of truth. I've just added in the chat um, a link. So when you signed up for this webinar, we suggested that you would have a flipped exercise to do, you know, modeling exactly what we were uh, wanting to debate today. Um, so in the link, there is a question about whether you have done this homework. So I'm just going to give people 30 seconds, a minute to um, pick the link, answer, and then I'll share the results of what people have put into that Google form. Um, so this is where the elevator music would have been very useful. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just be quiet so you can think. Um, Lillian, that link is taking me to the results rather than the rather than. Oh, the is it? Question. Okay, yeah. two seconds. The form. Uh, thanks for. Okay, here is the actual form. Then view form. Same, we haven't got anyone who can play a musical instrument. Oh. You're muted, Alice, there, if you were uh, I think we have. I, I was going to offer my uh, tin whistle. I can play the guitar, but... Uh... <laughs> Teachers are so bad at being quiet. There you go. <laughs> Having passed on Friday, uh, my grade two flute. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'm not very good. <laughs> and Beth makes a very good point. There wasn't an option for partially completed, which is likely that students will turn up partially completed their flipped homework. Yeah. Also, I assume that those who haven't completed it probably won't go in to select no. So that'll probably <laughs> skew the statistics as well. Yeah, yeah. No, so that that's, that's our... A learning point for all of us if we ever want to do this again but um and it's on the recording as well to remember next time we run this to to give people a, a third option as well um and uh yeah we'll just got 19 responses i might just wait until we get about 20 at least and then we'll there we go okay so this time around we've got a lot more no's than yeses uh, and again, quite quite useful to, um, so the first bit of the answers is what people got out of the flipped homework uh, when they reviewed the recordings and looked through the content. And no, I've not completed the flipped exercise. I love this bit because it allows us to have a look at the up-to-date, the dog ate my homework excuses. So what, what dogs have eaten what this year? Um, <laughs> so... I was not aware of the exercise, time, forgot, slipped my mind, uh, a bit too busy, <laughs> nobody made me, um, wasn't aware. So these are, these are very, very likely um, as much our messaging as, as much as anything else, because the messaging was built into the sign up form, right? And we didn't then follow up to ask you to do the exercise, although we did tweet about it. So that's fine. 
And anything else you could have done to help you complete? Um, <laughs> big stick. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if you mean waving one or sending you one or or what. Um, but yeah, that's fine. You know, these are these are little things that maybe you kind of think they remind me of what students would say as well. And I thought you might find it interesting to look back at the last time we did this exercise in 2020. Um, we had 50% of people doing the exercise. I don't think we did anything different. Maybe people were a little bit more, they needed that information a little bit more last time because this was pre-lockdown. And um, What's your key takeaway? Uh, again, there was uh, some information there, but not completed the exercise. Again, forgot, no time, <laughs> um, busy with other things. I didn't see it. Um, so excuses haven't changed that much, to be honest. Uh, nothing, nothing different. Um, anything we could have done, uh, similar things. Remind me, too many emails, etc. I'm not sure, you know, if we would ever um, get around this uh, particular um, trend. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing here. Um, but yeah, um, what might be quite fun is to start collecting these uh, reasons from your students in order to get some insights into maybe ways and means of encouraging them to kind of uh, get stuck in with their flipped uh, resource. Um, right, so just looking at the chat, and then I think we can go on to our guest speakers. Yeah, Nikki, we don't just tweet, we do uh, add into our um, uh, JISC mail list, future teacher uh, mailing list as well. Uh, and a prize, maybe, maybe a prize would be a good idea. Um, but yeah, if you're teaching every week and you're using flipped learning every week, you'd <laughs> that'd be quite a cost in prizes. <laughs> Maybe students can uh, contribute some prizes to, to the prize pool. So that's a nice idea. Okay, so um, Teresa, can I uh, ask you to uh, introduce Roger to uh, everyone here? Yes, indeed. I can see Alistair with his bell. He's muted at the moment, but I know that he's going to ring his bell. So maybe he's making the point, Roger, that um, he will <laughs> use his bell to uh, give you a warning that you've got just a few minutes left. Is that uh, right, two, two bells. There's, one two is bells. the halfway point. So uh, six minutes in, I'll give you one bell. And then 11 minutes, I'll give you another bell. So oh, Sorry, how, how long do I have then? I was under the impression it was 10. It's, it's 10 minutes plus... Q and A. Uh, okay, so, that, that, yeah. that's that's fine. You'll get the same content. I just speak a lot quicker. <laughs> <laughs> I want. I just want to share with people just how excited I was after I had a conversation with Roger about participating today. Roger is an experienced uh, teacher and has lots and lots of. Um, examples good examples of how he's used flip learning in his teaching so what, what i was asking him to do now is to reflect on how the pandemic um, changed all that and whether it changed all that and and the also how he sort of translates his teaching ethos um, once everything was forced online i was so excited when i completed that conversation i can't wait to hear from him today so I'm, I'm sure you will really enjoy this and i'm sure you're going to get a lot from uh, the um experience that roger has that he's bringing us today so roger over to you if you'd like to share your slides okay. hopefully everybody can now see yeah that's perfect. my slides excellent okay well thank you very much for that that's quite a big build up i fear um uh, yeah, just a little bit, um, really, to say that I've, I've been teaching for 26 years. Um, I've been using flip lectures, I calculated the other night, for about uh, 12 years. Um, and sort of the main reason for doing that was the fact that um, I, I found traditional lecturing to be something that was quite difficult. Um, and although over the years I developed ways of, uh, of addressing some of those issues, so sort of, you know, asking questions and, and giving questions that they could sort of work in groups to answer. Um, the, all that actually meant was that there was less time to uh, cover the material. So you either had to pick and choose what material you covered um, or try and cover less or, it, you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to manage. Um, so I wanted to find a way to, to address that. And for, I was very lucky many years ago um, to listen actually twice in a very short period of time to a gentleman called Graham Gibbs. 
Um, and at the time he was promoting this idea of time on task um, as being the, the focus for um, teaching in higher education. Um, so it really came out of that. So um, I've got some slides, hopefully these are gonna work. Um, so I, as I say, I've been uh, doing flip lectures for quite some time and I'm quite lucky in that um, at Worcester, my boss was very receptive. Um, and so he was quite happy for me uh, to flip the lectures um, and it didn't actually make any difference to the amount of time that we were in the classroom. So I came from a situation where we had three hour blocks in class um, and for most lecturers, what they would do was lecture for um, an hour, hour and a half, um, and uh, then they would give the students a break, um, and then they would effectively use the second half as a, as a seminar. These were quite small groups. Um, the maximum size for the room was about 48. Um, and then when I joined De Montfort, similar situation, I inherited an unusual module in the sense that it was just a single three hour block, as opposed to the majority of them, which are uh, you know, one hour lecture, one hour seminar. And in fact, in De Montfort's case, uh, they had been a seminar every other week because of the size of the modules that were being uh, delivered. So when we went online, um, despite the fact that there had been some reluctance from, from many colleagues in terms of uh, using flipped lectures, essentially that's what we were asked to do. Um, so we were asked to make sure that all the material was uh, pre-recorded um, and therefore needed to concentrate on the seminars. And the one big advantage for me is that the decision was then made in terms of contact hours because we effectively taken uh, lectures away was that we would see our students every week in seminars um, and therefore we would focus on making those seminars much more uh, dynamic in terms of the learning experience. So I'm very much uh, somebody who enjoys uh, sort of what I would describe as active learning. Um, so it's problem-based, it's learning by doing. Um, and really that was one of the major things that affected me directly that not physically having students in a classroom did make some of the activities that I had been using um, much more difficult to undertake. So uh, using things like um, Lego, for example, became something which wasn't uh, possible. Although there is actually a, an online version of Lego that you can use uh, for experiences, but it's, it's not particularly easy to use. And it's not particularly intuitive. In terms of what we did with the flip lectures that was maybe different was that we realized that uh, students moving from an, uh, from an experience of going to a room on a particular day at a particular time for a 50 minute lecture and then having those lectures online uh, because, and again, this is one of the things I see as an advantage, um, your lecture can be as long or as short as you like. So, you know, if, if it's going to take you an hour and a half to talk about a subject, you can take an hour and a half because you're not, you know, the amount of time you have available isn't determined by a timetable. But it was recognized that from the student's point of view, um, we needed to make it so that it was uh, more bite-sized, more easily accessible. Um, so one of the things we did was this thing, it's not my term, but somebody described it as chunking. So we might take a 50 minute lecture and break it down into two or three smaller pieces. Um, and on my Blackboard side, what I actually had was an introduction to what was uh, needed to be done that week. Um, so it would actually say, uh, watch the, the following lecture. Then there would be lecture material um, then there would be another message underneath that said, okay, now uh, read this article and complete the worksheet um, or add to the wiki or uh, write a comment in the discussion thread. And then they might read a, uh, might watch a video which they had to do something with and then they might uh, go to a web link, uh, which might be a, a newspaper article or a journal article or whatever. So we broke everything down, including the lecture into much smaller pieces. And over the years, um, I've sensed that uh, students seem to be happier with that kind of uh, approach because it replicates more the way that they consume an awful lot of uh, other media. So particularly their experience in terms of social media is they're very rarely going to watch a video um, that's maybe more than a, a couple of minutes long. Now, having said which, because the alternative to that um, is the fact that, you know, people might binge watch something on uh, a streaming service. Um, and clearly, if somebody wants to binge watch all of your lectures on a particular subject, um, then that's going to mean that you're doing something very right. Uh, I realise now I'm not going fast enough. Uh, one of the other things I did to try and link the online stuff to what we were doing, sorry, the pre-recorded material to what we were doing in the classroom, uh, was I created a workbook uh, which contained all of the activities they needed to do week by week, and a study guide which helped reinforce the material 
that was on Blackboard. Advantages to doing flip lectures, you're not constrained by uh, a physical environment and therefore you can take as long or as uh, little time as you like. Um, you're not worrying about attendance. Um, and in particular, this means because students don't have to be in a particular place at a particular time, they can consume the material um, as and when they want. It has advantages with regards to something we call universal design for learning. And whilst I appreciate that uh, the theory behind learning styles um, has been somewhat poo-pooed in recent time, uh, I think people do have personal preferences when it comes to learning, whether that's um, auditory or uh, visual or textual. Um, and I certainly know when I was performing in plays, uh, I would learn lines using a, a visual memory technique. Um, having looked at what was in the chat, uh, one of the things is, uh, how do you know that people have engaged? Well, number one, we told people uh, that we would be uh, checking each week on the Blackboard engagement. Blackboard allows you to see um, how many students have been in, which students have been in, uh, how often they've been in, how long they've been on for. And we made a big thing of that to the students in advance so that they felt like we would be monitoring their attendance there in the way that we would have done in a traditional lecture. Um, but you can also use quizzes at the beginning of each week. Um, and there's various different uh, platforms that are available if you're doing uh, online teaching. So um, Kahoot, there is a, a Pulse um, uh, operation in uh, Blackboard Collaborate, Mentimeter, uh, Padlet if you want more um, uh, open responses. Um, and uh, those are good ways then of assessing what students have uh, done with the uh, pre-recorded material. When we used to do this in class, um, we used to have uh, quizzes that were, we used to have quizzes that were based on uh, quiz shows and we actually did give um, prizes to the top team and we used to do that every week. I have to say it was only ever a small box of shareable chocolate so uh, it wasn't too onerous. Um, one of the other things is to base the discussion questions that were in the class on the material that was actually in the lecture and make it very clear each week that the students were going to be um, discussing amongst themselves, but we would also give them questions that they could bring their own experience to. Um, and I'm very lucky, I suppose, because I teach marketing um, and all of us have experience of marketing because we've all uh, been consumers and bought things and, and made judgments on things. Um, so you can encourage students to uh, participate by reflecting on their own experience. Uh, my wife would tell you that she got sick and tired of me uh, or hearing me saying, okay, there's 12 people in the room, I'd like 12 answers on. And to be fair, because they were giving their answers at the same time, as opposed to sitting in a classroom, looking around, at, you know, each other waiting for someone to take the lead, they actually did participate more, I felt. Um, and if you used any of the quiz options, most of them are available um, to respond anonymously as well. So that would encourage the students to participate. Um, I also found another platform called Topia. Um, Collaborate does allow you to lose uh, breakout rooms, um, but the breakout rooms really didn't work very well. It's quite a clunky operation and you can only be with certain groups at a time. I went to a Playful Learning Association conference um, at which they were using this particular platform uh, where uh, students have an avatar which they drop into this space. You can create the space and edit the space yourself um, and the big advantage to it is that um, as you walk around, if you walk over to other people, um, then the little video box appears and you can interact with them. So I could send students to different parts of the space. I could still see all of the students. So I could wander over and, and speak to them. They could wander over and speak to me. But we always felt that there was this sense of space. Um, and we could also use a timer them to get them back into the room um, as and when they needed. Uh, I'm particularly open to any questions you might have. I think I did add a reference slide in case anyone's looking for any of the background material uh, on uh, flipped lectures. If I stop there, I haven't heard the second bell. Timing. There you go. That was perfect. I think that's perfect timing. <laughs> so um, do we want to uh, take some questions now? Or should we move on to Alistair? Um, and then answer all questions towards the end. I think usually we, we do move on to the next speaker. Um, Roger, feel free to answer people in the chat, but we'll regroup at the end and uh, address all the questions uh, together at that point. Um, so yeah, I think we'll move on to you, Alistair, if that's okay. 
Okay, thank you very much. So if I share my screen. And um, it's going to be harder for me to give myself a bell. So do feel free to just shout at the halfway mark. Let me just see if I can. I'll make a uh, big carrot noises. <clears throat> yeah, make a carrot noise. Okay. So what I want to do is look to uh, flipped learning in terms of the implications for inclusion. And so I've tried to pick out a lot of the recent research on online learning, disabled students, etc., to work out what would feed into flipped learning. Now, um, Advanced HE have got uh, a useful resource on flipped learning where they talk about the four pillars of flipped learning. Um, and they note that they're highly variable, or I note that they're highly va variable. They use the acronym FLIP <coughs> for obvious reasons. But this variability is important because when you look at the research, the research often shows benefits for flipped learning for, for any student, never mind a student with a disability. But it often shows quite a lot of variability. And when you look at the these four pillars of flipped learning, flexible environment, the space, the mode of delivery, the timeliness, the learning culture, whether it's learning centered, whether it's scaffolded, how metacognitive it's sort of designed intentionally to be, the intentional content, whether it's focused, appropriate, etc. There's a lot of variables in there. So it's not surprising sometimes that the research comes back with slightly different um, perspectives. However, <clears throat> just to kind of look at some recent research and recent surveys, I start with a workplace survey, the um, Calidus Workplace Survey Report, which has got um, over a thousand respondents. And this was asking people in work, and again, it's not asking disabled students, it's about people in work, just trying to say generally what is most effective for teaching and learning. And what was very interesting was that the most effective learning um, approaches, and I've tried to highlight them, this is a, this is a rather um, kind of complex diagram here, but <clears throat> you don't need to worry about the diagram because the, the three key messages are what I put in the text here. Um, the, the three key messages in this are that if, if the green on the diagram is very effective and then the blues are and purple are not effective, then what we find is that equal first in terms of learning effectiveness, according to these thousand respondents, was on the job and micro lessons. Second, videos and podcasts. Third was social engagements of social learning of one kind or another. And micro lessons, videos, podcasts and social interaction, active learning, they are often very fundamental elements of flip learning. So that ties in very nicely. But let's look specifically at disabled learners. And again, let's look across the sectors. The Ofsted report um, in 2021 on remote education and the impact on people with special educational needs and disabilities noted that many um, students benefited from the improved structure and routine of online learning, from shorter frequent lessons in bite-sized chunks, from revisiting content, the ability to look back and watch a video, and from learning at their own pace. And there's there's a further blog there that, again, the links are available. I'll give you the, the link to this slideshow in a moment. <clears throat> and these are all really positive things that are integral to a lot of flipped learning opportunities, how you build flipped learning. If we were to have a look across the sector and go a little bit higher up to higher education, then we find that there's a, a March 2022. In fact, it was only, I think it was um, a week ago, maybe a fortnight ago at the most, but I think it's uh, about a week ago. Uh, Disabled Students UK published this report, big report, lots of research, 362 respondents from 69 universities and HEIs. It wasn't about flipped learning. It was about what, what were the positive benefits of the online learning that took place <clears throat> and uh, during COVID and how important it is not to then go back to just face-to-face -face teaching. So it wasn't about flipped learning per se, but as always, the things that work best in online learning are often the things that lend themselves most neatly to a flipped environment. So 
84.5% of disabled students said that they would benefit from online distance and teaching, um, distance and online learning and teaching being an option after the pandemic. But 53%, so just over a half, didn't just say they would benefit, but they would benefit a lot. And one of the big issues that people noticed was the failure to incorporate accessibility into delivery. So the <clears throat> either accessibility of the flipped resources that people were working with or um, failure of accessibility in the videos that they were looking at, those sorts of elements. That actually resulted, thank you, excellent, that resulted in the need for staff to have appropriate resources and training in order to be able to implement those. So there was a proviso, yes, please give us more online, but no, please don't make it inaccessible. And um, generally, the experience, there was more good than bad. So 11% said that the accessibility of their course significantly improved during the pandemic. 30%, it kind of improved overall, 29% neutral, um, and then 30% as opposed to 31% said it either worsened a bit or worsened significantly. Um, I think I got my numbers wrong. I did, yes, yeah, sorry, 41% significantly or um, improved, 30% worsened or improved or um, worsened overall. So some notable positives. And again, that's because if we know what works with online learning, we can then say, let's grab those bits and use them in flipped learning. So lectures being recorded, live streamed lectures with anonymous interactive options. Now that was something I found really interesting anonymous interactive options so the ability like with prezi or the ability not with prezi um sorry um mentimeter the ability to be able to uh, use mentimeter or slido to be able to give responses without seeing your name up there next to it thinking oh everybody will know i got the wrong one so for people with anxiety people with mental health issues and so on that's brilliant being able to be anonymous whilst interacting. The seminars, the supervisions, the alternative ways of communicating with tutors online via email or via social media, um, alternative assessments, online, open house, clinics, drop-in sessions, whatever you call them. So there were many positive mentions and flipped learning can provide all of those. Flipped learning has that in its DNA. And then the other aspect about th this report where disabled students were feeding back what really matters to them, it was the physical accessibility of online. So if you're using online learning, flipped learning, um, either of those and the spectrum between them, then the reduced strain fatigue of having to get to a specific place. Um, so it resulted in increased attendance virtually access to recordings, alternative ways of engaging, alternative assessments, and the materials being available earlier or in more accessible formats. All of that is actually better online than the on-campus experience. And flipped learning can provide all of those. So I, I would um, say, okay, what, what are the superpowers of flipped? <clears throat> because obviously online learning encompasses a lot of things. Today, we're focusing on the flipped element, but I'm trying to draw together the things from online learning that we can easily incorporate into flipped. But something that's interesting, uh, there was a bit of uh, research, an Iranian case study um, earlier this year, January this year, where it wasn't a huge sample size, so you don't know how replicable it would be. But what it suggested was that a synchronous approach where like today, we're all together in the same place at the same time, that increases learners incentive and attention. An asynchronous approach where there's stuff online they look at separately, that increases their data processing ability and their organization. And of course, flipped learning has both of those. It's got the synchronous, it's got the asynchronous, it's got the stuff you do on your own and the stuff you do with the tutor. Um, is there a flip learning kryptonite? If flipped learning is a superpower, what is the kryptonite? What was interesting is there's other research last year which showed that flipped learning has different size gains in different contexts. It produces 
massive gains, you know, sizable gains in foreign languages, technology, medical science, or when implemented in Asian and Middle Eastern countries, where the alternative was much more didactic. In other contexts, though, um, engineering, maths, etc., or a North American, Australian context, the educational benefits were much more modest. So that's a quick run through, and and that's it from me. So back to Ron and Lillian now. Thank you very much, Alistair. So. Um... At this point, we would normally have questions and answers, but just before we go into that, um, when we've done some Q&A, I'd like to make sure that we have some time to discuss the idea of um, flipped learning and how we can make it more inclusive. Um, because I think there's an underlying assumption that obviously if we flip and a lot of, uh, in, in the chat, Alistair, a lot of people have been talking about the fact that uh, providing people with materials in advance has been really good for students with disabilities and neurodiverse students mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but, you know, uh, is there more we can do to make sure it's more inclusive and not just to those um, user groups? Um, so what I'm going to do is um, uh, I'm going to uh, run through some of the questions that I've I've observed in the chat and, and put them to Roger and Alistair. And if Teresa, if you spot anything else after this point, uh, you, you could host the questions uh, after this. Um, so, uh, so Roger, thank you very much for that. It was, it was really, really interesting to hear what you had to say then and the experience, uh, what drove you to kind of using or finding your own tool. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we were talking a little bit about third party tools and about accessibility and GDPR, which, you know, um, begs the question then, when you were picking your tools, how, how did you come to a decision about um, what tool to use? Did you bear accessibility and GDPR? Um, did you take those into account? The simple answer is yes. I, I'm, I, GDPR is something of a uh, a red herring, I think, with an awful lot of the platforms that are available. Uh, they're open platforms. They're non-charging. Um, there is no real registration. You you know you register by um, email or some of them are, are, are direct access. You're not giving them access to your Facebook account or giving them any details beyond um, an email address. Which, let's face it, we give out in thousands of in places with lots of extra information. Um, so uh, yeah, it was a mixture of those two things. It doesn't require the downloading of any software. Um, and they're actually very widely used. It was quite funny because in, in one meeting, um, one of my colleagues was getting uh, quite uh, sort of heated uh, in his expression of uncertainty about things like uh, Kahoot Mentimeter, which many of my colleagues have been using for quite a long time. Uh, and I had to point out to him that I'd actually just come from an advanced HE uh, seminar in which precisely those tools had been used. So, you know, if the sort of one of the lead academic bodies for the sector um, is using them, then, you know, you, you're kind of going to expect that, that these things are, are available. Um, uh, picking up on one of Alistair's points, um, I think there is a huge advantage to um, resources that allow students to remain anonymous. And even when I'm using Padlet, um, you know, you can you can set it so that uh, the students' responses are uh, anonymous. Um, so even where they're maybe commenting on each other's um, postings, they're they're not necessarily going to know you know who that who that person is. Um, and again, I've got colleagues whose experience. One colleague in particular, um, who teaching intercultural perspectives, um, gets the students to write slam poetry, um, and then post that using a Padlet. And then they are also invited if they wish to um, to create um uh, an audio uh, version of the the poem so they can actually sort of read it out as well in case they wanted to put extra expression into that that's completely um up to them to do and uh, she had a fantastic response and part of the reason she got a fantastic response apart from the sort of quite creative and, and different way of doing it i think was because of that anonymity it gave students the opportunity to feel like they could participate without necessarily being judged um, or certainly judged directly but no, I, I, there's so much free and open access stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, we're appearing on Zoom now. I've been on plenty of Zoom meetings. I, I don't have a contract with Zoom. 
Um, you know, I don't have to particularly give any details to Zoom. Same thing, I guess, you know, when we use lots of other platforms. Mm. Thanks for that. And um, a question to both of you, really, Alistair and Roger, about this idea of whether um, there is a, a sense that we're all being uh, asked to move towards more hybrid approaches. So not just flipped and and not just um, not just flipped for face to face and not just flipped for online, but this idea that we then move into a world where we have to try and run these things in a hybrid fashion. Um, so Roger mentioned it was quite difficult, you know, pivoting to online when you had something quite a tactile activity like using Lego in the class. So you've had to kind of devise other methods. But if you then had to run a session that was both yeah. <laughs> face to face and live, that brings another layer of difficulty, doesn't it? It doesn't. The you know the the jury is definitely still out on hybrid, and I've seen um, I've seen lots of quite negative um, research, negative results coming in from hybrid learning, and it's vastly more complicated as a tutor or uh, lecturer. It's very much more complicated to be engaging both. Now I think some people can do it and do do it in some circumstances, and if I was teaching some subjects i'm sure it would be easier than others you know like any that involved lego or something tactile but i i think the argument in a way looking at it from a disabled student's point of view actually what they're just asking for what they're begging for is what they were told for 20 years we can't do that we can't record lectures um you know there's copyright reasons about that there's all sorts of reasons why we can't record lectures and suddenly you know, in the space of a few months, everything's being recorded. What they don't want to do is go back to that. I'm not sure they're really arguing for hybrid. I think what they're arguing for is much more effective use of um, content being available before the lecture, um, technologies being used within the contact. And I think really they're arguing for more technology use rather than specifically hybrid learning and if anything flip learning i think meets their agenda far better than hybrid learning might my experience this year has been of hybrid learning for reasons that i don't really understand uh, the university decided that um, all of the lectures would remain um, asynchronous um, partly, I suppose, because of the effort that went into creating asynchronous material um, from last year, um, but that all of the seminars uh, would be run on a hybrid basis. So we have students, this was particularly for international students who simply you know, couldn't make it over here um, for COVID reasons and, and possibly visa reasons as well, uh, were still able to participate in the, in the live sessions. Um, and it also meant that at the beginning of the time for students who either um, had COVID or who got pinged because they were in close contact with somebody who'd got COVID, who therefore had to isolate, also had that option of still being able to uh, effectively join a, a live session. Um, most of my colleagues, I suspect, would agree um, that it has not worked well at all because of the differences in how you interact with people who are either online or not online. Um, I don't think that we should get rid of the online option for a number of different reasons. I just don't think it should be done at the same time as a live in-classroom um, event because they're, they operate in, in two very different ways. And it's, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, trying to run group work is very difficult when you've got you know, the majority of people in class and, and a smaller number mm. online or a majority of people online and a, a smaller number in class. And I'm not a big fan of, of breakout rooms because it tends to isolate people and it's very difficult as the lecturer to keep on top of that. Um, whereas when you have people in the classroom, it's it's much easier to um, to get them to work in smaller groups because you're always physically able to see what's um, what's going on. So we have used that form of hybrid teaching. I suspect we will be keeping in fact, actually, I know we will be keeping some of the pre-recorded stuff uh, for next year. We will also be expected to give live lectures, um, whether they'll be online or in a classroom, I don't know. Um, and then I suspect that they will probably keep hybrid teaching 
um, in the seminars for next year unless they listen to us and say, OK, well, we've got 10 seminars, so eight of them will just be live and in the classroom and two of them will be live but online um, to allow for students to prefer to work that way. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. And um, now we've done a bit of a segue because we're all very keen on the whole hybrid idea. Um, but I wondered if we could draw it back to flipped for, yeah. for a few minutes, because one key thing that we wanted to discuss was how to make the flipped activities that we create more inclusive to all students. Um, so I wonder if we could start with that for, you know, I'll keep an eye on the clock for maybe about four four minutes and then we'll move on to another discussion point. But, but also Lillian before we do there's been quite a reaction to um what Roger was saying about you know if if someone else if a big KG organization is using Padlet then then it's not something to worry about I think we all realize that you know using activities that are non anonymous in a flipped learning context it's quite a useful thing rather than tracked individuals, but that's very different to using tools that meet GDPR because, because of all the data that's collected behind the scenes that, you know, in some cases, the students have got no control of. So there's, there's quite a discussion there. I don't know whether anyone that has raised those comments want to turn on their mic or turn on their webcam and, and just quickly raise that. And just to say, we do have a, a separate topic, separate webinar on all of that um, under the getting savvy with digital tools mm. and technologies. But unfortunately, that's not until May. We have the previous recordings and resources about some of that, and some of the the issues that have been discussed in the text chat have been have been covered in in that, and we will cover again. Um, but I wonder whether we should just before we move on, just very quickly pick up on that discussion because there is a kind of possibly two schools of thought about those external tools. Hi, um, just as, if it's okay, I'm happy to chat about that. I'm a learning technologist at the University of Edinburgh and we have to deal with these things all the time. So we do highly recommend that staff use the, the tools that are provided by the university because they've already gone through GDPR data protection uh, auditing and they've already gone through accessibility auditing as well. So we've vetted these tools. Mm. Unfortunately, sometimes they get away from us <laughs> and somebody's like, oh, I'm using this or I'm using that. And yeah, but the thing is, is <clears throat> it's very strongly one, if it's not accessible, you know, you're legally liable and it, it's just not the right thing to do. Two, um, all external apps will collect data regardless of whether they tell you about it or not they all and if you're requiring a student to do that then you are legally liable for the data that's collected so you have to be quite careful but as a learning technologist we don't just say oh slap your hand you can't do that what we say hey is you know what are you trying to achieve with this tool maybe we can find another tool and what i do is i go away and i research things and I come up with a tool that they can use that is just as good, if not better. And in the case of Padlet, I've actually come up with being able to use WordPress, which the university supports and hosts and has passed all the necessarily necessary checks. And in a lot of ways, it's a better tool. It's more versatile. Um, I have created an, an entirely accessible theme um, to, for them to be able to use. Uh, there's a lot more things that they can do with it than they can than they can do with Padlet. And also, I got it to look like Padlet. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we've done, used it in not just the way that the Padlet was being used before, because unfortunately, like, that was a rabbit, the cat that got out of the bag for another reason, um, and we've had to claw it back. But in replacing those activities from what Padlet was used before, like I said, we're not only making it better because it's accessible, but it's there's a lot of other uses. They've actually gone, oh, well, I can use it this way and I can use it that way. So I think we have to think about these things. One, we need to encourage staff to use what's been vetted already, but it isn't just saying, oh, no, you can't use that. There's tons of things out there that you can use. And it's just, it's what it's being used for. You know, what is, what are you trying to achieve? And in a flipped classroom and these types of things in online learning, that's what you have to get to the bottom of. And I think yeah. that's where we should come at it first. Um, and there, there, like I said, there's, and sometimes all singing, all dancing isn't the best. And if you're talking about accessibility for students, I think sometimes people get super excited and they want to use all singing, all dancing. <clears> and that's actually detrimental, not just to, to disabled students, but to students as a whole. 
So, yeah. I think those are really good points. And Nikki, we want to book you in for talking at our um, being savvy, savvy with session. digital tools. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be happy to. I actually do the accessibility with, training the for, yeah, for for our for our school, and I'm currently doing a micro masters for OU in in accessibility and online learning. So, this great. would be great. <laughs> Count yourself booked. <laughs> Yay! Thanks. <laughs> What I really liked about Nikki's contribution in the in the chat was it really makes us focus on the um, importance of dialogue, the importance of breaking down some yeah. of the silos that we work in. And, and I really feel for practitioners because during the pandemic, we've, we, what we're trying to do and our, our main focus is to find things that recreate our context. And for practitioners that aren't particularly, um, you know, don't have the time to go into researching tools. What are we doing as a learning technology community to make that, um, make these discussions around accessibility and data protection and all of these other issues easily available to practitioners? Um, and, and I think that's something else Nikki's signed up for as well, to get an alt C blog post on that. I think it'd be really good if we could make, have, have these open conversations. Brilliant. So um, I, I'm going to draw people back. Thank you uh, for, for that uh, discussion. I'm going to draw people back. Um, and Nikki, everyone wants a piece of your, your WordPress solution. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so that will be something we will we'll, we'll book you in for. Um, and uh, uh, that, that question then about creating extra accessibility for students um, with our flipped approaches, you know, so we're looking at, you know, when you're creating your resources, but also how you communicate it, how you help students to engage with the flipped resources, how you encourage students to make time for it, um, how you can make it a little bit more collaborative for them. Uh, does anyone want to chime in there with any ideas that they might have? Well, at the beginning of my presentation, um, one of the things that I was trying to say was quite badly. Um, so when we put the lectures online, um, I put my slides online. And uh, if there's material that I'm referencing on the slides, uh, there will then be web links underneath so that the students can actually go and look at where the material is in context. A lot of my slides tend to be uh, sort of primarily visual anyway. Um, and then they get a separate audio as an MP3 track so that if any of them want to listen to it as an MP3, they can do it because the majority of what I'm doing and when I'm talking about what's on the slide is, is actually giving them examples and stories. So I'm, I'm putting it into a context. We then have, uh, we use Panopto, which um, possibly some of the universities are using. So in other words, it's um, uh, 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 something which will amalgamate um, audio and visual so they can wa wa watch what is effectively a video of you delivering the lecture. So they can both see the slides, although they see it in slideshow, so they wouldn't be able to see the links underneath and hear me. And that will follow through so that um, particularly if they want to go back later and just look at a specific slide, they can then listen just to the audio that's relevant to that slide. And that was an attempt to offer um, students the option to decide how best they wanted to consume the material um, and I think I made the point if I didn't then I meant to make the point that um, I used to do a lot of uh, performance so I, I did about seven years of, of plays um, and having done plays at school I would I tried to learn them as I guess most people would just learning by rote so repeating the lines over and over again and I really struggled um, and then Quite a few years ago now, I came across a, a memory technique, um, which is described as the memory palace. In my case, it's a, a memory house or a memory journey to work. And it uses a very visual technique. And this was to remember lines for a play. And I suddenly found that this was the thing that absolutely worked for me. So whereas learning styles may have been discredited, I think people do still have uh, learning preferences. And then within the other materials, uh, we link to uh, so articles so that people can read them or video so that people can, you know, sort of watch them um, or listen to them. Um, and it's offering that that range of materials. But I think the other thing that's important is providing uh, a kind of structure to that. So within the Blackboard site, there, there is a series of steps that the students would go through. Um, but the point of the, the both the study guide and the workbook 
are effectively to give the students something where they can go, okay, this is week 10. I open my book to week 10, week 10. This is the first thing I need to do. Then I need to go off and do this. Then I need to do that. This is how long it should take me. Um, you know, this is how long I should be spending on it. This is how it's relevant to the assessment and so on and so forth. So it's really just giving extra structure, if you like. One of my big things is about, we can control what happens in the classroom. What we can't do is control what happens outside the classroom. And actually the la very last point you made is probably one of the most important things, I think, um, which is that idea of time management. Y you know, we have to address the fact that so many of our students are not particularly good at managing their own time. So we need to find ways to actually help them either to develop time management skills or to provide them with structures which support them in that way. Yeah, very good point. And, and I think that's exactly it, that actually we have to go beyond just communicating the curriculum and to all the other hidden curriculum matters and including, like you say, time management and even understanding what alternative formats work best for them. And maybe even, you know, how to convert something into another format uh, and being a bit more digital, digitally savvy about that so that they can uh, create materials from the flipped resources that work better for them as well. So not not always the tutor providing, but also teaching them to kind of fish, right? Teaching them to kind of adapt resources where they need it. Um, so yeah, that's that's really really good. And um, I have another uh, to, uh, link to share with everyone, and this is I think Gareth. This uh, was on the online, Gareth, are you here? No, I think he may have gone. So Gareth uh, at my university, uh, one of our other learning technologists produced a kind of um, toolkit at the time when we were, um, we had a department that was very interested in how they were gonna take the online learning um, practices that we'd all developed uh, forward and roll them into a kind of flipped resource. So uh, you're welcome to kind of have a look at the flipped learning toolkit that we we created for our staff. Um, I have yet to find someone who's uh, worked through it <laughs> because I think there is a plethora of um, material out there. And I think um, some of the reflections from the people who attended the webinar last time, uh, I wanted to pick up on one particular person who kind of said, there's a sense that we, we have to be very active researchers of what works for our students. So we have to kind of do action research, try things, get student feedback and feed that back into our practices. And I'm sure if we do that, we'll find that that golden point, that that balance with flipped learning um, and, and a way to kind of um, build students uh, into that process as co-producers of flipped resources, as co-writers and designs of our learning designs. Um, right, so um, in the last uh, few minutes, do we have uh, any further points we'd like um, raising? Uh, well, Lillian, just before we, we do that, we usually cover just the the post webinar activities or this this last few minutes activities so on our page which we've um we'll put the link back into the the text chat um we have this little panel here which um at the end of it has this what next session now all the resources from the previous sessions that we've already said are embedded in the the resource and the recording from <clears throat> this session will be embedded um, at some point, probably early next week, and we'll post news about that on the, the mailing list, the Future Teacher mailing list. So you can possibly see the bullet points here. I'll just zoom in very quickly to make that a bit easier to read. Um, so the, the main point here really is that we'll ask you to share what one thing you'll do as a result of what we've discussed today in the text chat. But there's also the schedule of all of our reflected sessions and a link to our expression of interest form to um, encourage people to sign up to be a guest speaker on one of the future sessions. So link to the mailing list. Please join that if you haven't already. Schedule of the reflected sessions will take you back to a, the first page of this resource. And then if there's a session you're interested in doing, then complete our registration form. The next one, if I just zoom back out here and go back to the homepage, 
um, there's this less list of the reflected sessions. The next one is on collaborative teaching and learning. Uh, no, and it's um, April. No, oh, no, they, they know. Sorry, no, what they know. Getting feedback from students. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, but that's where you'll get the link to those resources and to the the, the various actions. And as we sign out. Um, we ask you to, before you sign out, to just post in the text chat and then picking up on what Lillian just asked, is there anything else that anyone wants to pick up on? And I'm just going to share at that point as well that our guest speakers now get a future teacher badge from us, an open badge to display. So your contributions are uh, visibly valued by the community. So I've just posted in the chat so that people can type their what one thing you will do as a result of um, attending this webinar. And I'll just have a quiet reflection myself. Um, I think everyone wants a piece of Nikki's WordPress. <laughs> in, in case it's worth saying, because obviously we've not been able to cover a lot of material. Um, I have posted my email address in there. If anyone just wants to email either for a, a chat over email or Teams or um, there, there are other resources that I can pass on. I, I, you know, I'm always, I'm always happy um, to talk to colleagues, especially from other parts of uh, the country. Um, and it's always fascinating actually meeting people who teach uh, other things and seeing whether there are um, subject or discipline uh, specific issues, or indeed often actually it's somebody will say, well, I do this particular thing uh, in my class and it's something I've never thought of because they're talking about a different context but it can, it can be then borrowed and transferred and um, sort of you know uh, changed into something that's useful for for my particular subject area. We should mention although Alistair put it in the text chat he had to leave to prepare for the next session that he's delivering so um, normally he would be here and we when we stop the recording, we usually have a bit of informal chat as well. So, but unfortunately on this occasion, Alistair had to go. Brilliant. So it's got quite a lot of useful things people are going to explore. Oh yes, uh, let's come back to what David was asking about the reason for turning off the cameras. And this is my perspective and, and Ron can correct me, but when we do, when we post the recordings up onto YouTube, usually you will see what the speaker has shared and you tend to see the speaker uh, in camera on, on, on the window. Now, just on the odd occasion, if someone has their camera turned on and they've not muted their mics, if, if anything happens, like they accidentally knock something on their desk, you know, that flips around and suddenly instead of the, the main speaker, you might see another person on the screen. So we're just kind of trying to kind of reduce the chance of that happening. But Ron, was there another reason? Um, well, it's, it's that, it's the audio. And also actually it's very difficult when you're listening to be in that kind of mode that I'm listening on a, a, a Zoom platform. So I need to look as though I'm paying attention. So what you get is a number of people that are kind of looking out the window or looking all, and, and even, you know, I'm sharing my screen here. I'm looking, the, the webcam is making it look as though I'm looking somewhere else and not paying attention. So actually it is very distracting. I know in a teaching and learning context, maybe you would want all of that in the, it may provide a good assessment method, but you know, for our Zoom recordings and sharing the recording afterwards, it's better if it's just the main presenter that's sharing their screen. Yeah, you're smiling, like Rosemary uh, Teresa. Do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> I think there are a few things in there that I wouldn't necessarily agree with, but it's kind of for the, the purpose of the purposes of the recording and putting that out there. That totally makes sense um, yeah. to me. Yeah, um, it's quite different from a seminar, isn't it, where you would want, you know, to see people's faces. And I mean, at this point, for instance, we would uh, I, I'm going to uh, stop the recording here uh, because I think we have uh, concluded our official webinar.